Welcome all the rest of our visitors. I'm so happy that you're here today. And to everyone that comes all the time, welcome as well. Happy Sabbath. And I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we're happy to have you here today. We're happy that you're here. And I have an announcement. We have something called Vacation Bible School that is coming up. And it will be June 10 through 14. All ages are welcome to participate. We need volunteers for counselors, and we need volunteers for all the stations, registration. So whatever you feel that your gift is, that's where we want to have you. And we're happy to um, invite all children from 3 years to 12 years old to come. We're not going to charge this year, but donations are definitely welcome because you know that VBS is not free for us. <laughs> And um, if you go outside right after you leave or when you came in, I'm sure you saw the QR codes for VBS. I'm going to be outside in the atrium right outside of the church. After church, feel free to talk to me if you have questions. And we'd love for you to just look. And if you're interested, sign up, okay? Have a lovely Sabbath. And thank you for coming. We'll talk later. Come on, kids. You know what time it is. Where are the kids? Whoa, there he is. All right, you want to go out and get some money for us? All right, we're going to get collect money for our school. Any other kids out there? I see a couple. Come on, come on. You got a lot of money to collect. Thank you, yeah. Help out with our little red school here. We are, if you're new to our church, you're visiting today, what we're doing is we are collecting money for our, we have a children's school here, um, an Adventist school right here on location, and we're collecting money for, to help support any kids that want to go there. Uh, it's a great place where kids get to learn about Jesus every day. This box is getting nice and full. That's good. All right, kids, you guys have done a great job. Who got the most? Can you lift that up? All right, Will has got my prop here. Come on up. We've got a children's story for you. Come on up here for a children's story. Come on up, find a seat somewhere up front, and let me tell you a little story. Did, uh, did we get us any, I sent a thing, and I don't know if you got it. If you got it, it's okay. Oh, perfect, perfect. I have a little Bible verse for you that says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, the Bible talks about that the, there's armor that we have as a Christian, and our sword is the Word of God. The Word of God is the Bible. So did you know like memorizing Scripture, did you know that memorizing the Bible is like having a sword? Did you know that? 
How can it be a sword? How can it protect you? Well, what if, what if your mom and dad were, were worried about not having enough money? And you hear them arguing about, well, I lost my job. We lost our insurance. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, then you remember the word of God. What does the word of God say? My God, mom and dad, why are you worried? My God shall supply all your needs. And it's like a sword, putting out a sword. that The devil comes along and says, you guys need to be afraid. You're not going to be okay. And you put your sword out and say, no, God says this. Ah! And you get, you get rid of fear with the word of God. What if you're feeling lonely and you say, I don't have any friends. No one loves me. That's what the devil comes to you and says, you're, nobody likes you. But then you remember the word of God and what, the word, what does the word of God say? I will be with you always. And you remember that and it banishes fear. <coughs> the word of God, the word of God is our sword. It protects us when you're feeling like you're not good enough and you're not going to go to heaven. Then the Bible remember, tells us that my uh, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not die. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. So the word of God is our sword. Will has a sword up here. <coughs> Let me tell you a little story about how some people use a sword or a spear. The word of God is a protection. When the devil comes to us to tempt us with things, like the devil tempts us, you should take that thing and take the money out of your mom's purse. Take it. Take it. You want it. But the word of God says, thou shall not steal. We hide behind the word of God and we protect ourselves from the devil's attacks by defending ourselves with the word. And I want to tell you about somebody who used a sword to protect themselves. But I've been thinking, I'm not sure if I really should tell you this kind of scary story. But I don't want to scare you guys. You, you think you can handle it? You sure? You dare me. I mean, it's not a nice story. It, it has some scary things in it. You guys triple dog dare me? Okay. All right. Can we have the next picture here? There we go. So who's that? This guy is a Maasai warrior. Now, my brother, my younger brother, Scotty, when he was in college, he went as a missionary to Africa, and uh, he brought back a Maasai spear. I didn't bring the actual Maasai spear, but I brought one that looks very much like it. I thought it would have been wood, but it was metal. It was very much like this. And uh, my brother told me a story about the Maasai, and uh, I haven't really done my research to corroborate the facts of the story, but my brother told me the story, and I like it, so I'm going with it. Okay, so the story is that the Maasai, they think they own all the animals of Africa. All the wildebeest are theirs, and they hunt them down. You know, they still run around. They look like that. They don't drive in trucks, and they run, they run the animals down with their spears, and they hunt them. But you know what they do in special is when you are growing up as a Maasai man or as a boy, maybe you guys are a little bit too young but I don't know let me see how tall you are yeah when you're getting about this size they say all right boy it's time for you to become a Maasai man and you have to prove yourself as a Maasai man they have a test that you can prove that you can take care of your village that you have become a man when you're a Maasai warrior you know what the test is there's another picture the next picture, there's the Maasai warrior. He's going out by himself, and he has one thing in his hand. What does he have? He has his spear. They say, to prove that you are a man and that you are now a man in the Maasai village, that you can take care of your people, you must defend us from the most ferocious beast in Africa, the lion. Now, a lion, if you've ever seen a big cat, they're not so scary if they're just laying around. And so it's not that hard to kill a lion. You just walk up and you, they, they're lazy out in the sun. You can sneak up on them and shoot them with their spear. And that would be that. That's not how they do it. They want to know, the Messiah want to know that you can protect the village when a lion is hungry and he's coming after the village. 
So you have to demonstrate that you can fight off a lion. Now, this is why I'm sorry. I don't know if I should finish. You guys, this is the rest of the story is a little bit intense. You okay with it? Okay, triple dog Jeremy. Here we go. All right. So the Maasai warrior has to find a lion, rile the lion up, get him riled up where that lion is mad and angry and is going to attack him. And then he has to stand there and be attacked by the lion. And he can only defend himself. He cannot attack the lion, but he can only defend himself. And here's how they do it. So the Maasai warrior takes off on his own with his spear. Alone in the village, they watch him from a distance. And he searches and searches for the lion. It's like the devil. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour, who he's going to eat. So they look around. He looks around. And he's hunting. And he finally spots a lion out there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe. So he finds a lion. And the lion's sleeping in the sun. So he has to wake up the lion and get him riled up. So what does he do? He looks at, comes up to the lion and he says, You know what the lion does? The lion's sleeping over here. And the lion goes, And so what does the Maasai warrior do? He says, and the lion says, But the lion wants to go back to sleep. So he picks up some rocks and he throws the rocks at the lion. And the lion goes, and he says, I told you this is scary. It's too scary. You sure? Okay. And the lion starts to get mad now. And so he yells more. Now, I don't know. That's what they say. If anybody knows Messiah, you can tell me what I just said. And so the lion gets mad now. They're like, the lion's getting mad. The lion's getting up. And the lion's starting to get ready to come after him. And does the Messiah get scared now? He's scared. He's shaking in his boots, but he's got to show that he's a man. So he stands there. And the lion shows that's it. The lion comes after him. The lion, the lion gets up and starts to come. The lion is charging full speed now. You ever seen a cat run full speed? Its legs are like this. It's like a rabbit. The lion is coming at him. The lion is going to defend his village too. And the, the Maasai warrior, what does he do? Is he allowed to attack? He's only allowed to defend. But he has his sword, his spear. And that lion's coming. Rah, rah, rah. And the Maasai warrior stands there like this. And that lion is coming at him, and he's coming, he's charging him. And then the warrior, who has heard the stories of his father and his father's fathers, how they defended themselves against the lion. He does what they told him to do. You know what he does? He does this. At the last second, when the lion is jumping up in the air, just about to land on him, the Messiah does this. <gasps> He plants his spear in the ground, and he hides below it like this. And the lion is flying through the air with his claws out. But where does the lion land? On the spear. And it tickles, so he goes away. He hides behind his spear, the sword, the word of God. He says, I will not be afraid. God is with me. The word of God is our protection. No matter what comes in our way, 
we have a, a Bible verse that we can memorize that can give us courage and strength. As that Messiah hides behind that sword and it saves his life and he becomes a man. He becomes a man because he hid behind the sword. We become men and women because we trust in the word of God. The word of God. The name of the Lord, Will, is a what? Shield. The name of the Lord is a shield. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Anyone? Anyone out there? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and are saved. We run into the sword. We hide in the Lord and we are saved. Memorize your memory verses. How many of you know Bible memory verses? You know one? You want to say one? You know one? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Awesome. You know one too? Wait. You tell us later. Beautiful. Happy Sabbath, okay? Have a great day. Love you. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't compete with that. <laughs> anyway, what I'm going to steal from the children's story is Triple Dare. It's time for our tithes and offerings. And I Triple Dare you guys to come up with a good offering for the Lord and for this church. And uh, we don't have the list up there, but I just looked at the tithe envelope, and there's a whole bunch of places in there you can look at and and dedicate your funds to for your offerings and your tithes is how the word of the Lord gets out through the tithes and offerings. And if you'd like to help that, we will take up our offerings now. Will the deacons come forward with the offering plates? And shall we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back a portion of, that you have already given us, Lord. And we ask for this funds to you to take charge and to see that all these funds go to the proper place and do the most good for your work. So be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So those who can kneel now, kneel for their congregational prayer. And uh, dear Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you will be with us this morning through your Holy Spirit. Walk amongst us, Lord. Not only walk amongst us, Lord, but come into our hearts. We turn ourselves over to you. Without you, we have no life no ability to fight evil or anything else. We have to work as a team. 
allowing you to live in us and to do your goodwill and pleasure. We ask for this on a constant daily basis. We need to ask for you each and every day, and we pray that you will do the, what you promise to do because we know you can't uh, lie to us at all, Lord. We're the ones that uh, don't hold our end up most of the time. We pray for this church, that you will protect it and put your angels around it, and for the school, and for all the programs that are going on. Um, we ask that if anybody wants to uh, take Bible lessons with, with this church, that uh, you'll come forward and, and we'll be able to uh, bring you to the Lord. We thank you for everything you've done, and we ask you to help with the problems that are going on in the world. We know you're in charge. We know everything in the Bible is going to come true. So be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we are really blessed this morning to be able to have with us the uh, Conejo at Venice Valley School. You know as that music is such an important part, element in worship. It's a blessing to be able to praise God, worship God, and we're just so thankful to God that we have you with us uh, this morning to bless us and lift us up. And so we want to invite you to come up at this time. And um, once again, we're grateful to the school for coming and being with us today.
nation groans for a world in darkness frozen like a stone light is breaking in a stable for a throne if i were a wise man i would travel far if i were a shepherd i would do my part for as i am i would give to him my heart and he shall reign forevermore forevermore and he shall reign forevermore forevermore born to us a child is born the king of kings the lord of lords and he shall reign forevermore forevermore born to in a manger lies the one who built the starry skies His baby born for sacrifice Christ the messiah into our hopes into our fears the savior of the world appears promised for eternal years christ the messiah and he shall reign forevermore forevermore 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 born to us a child is born the king of kings and the lord of lords and he shall reign forevermore forevermore and he shall reign he shall reign, he shall reign forevermore. We may now ask that the children come up so we can, uh, teach them the hand signals. Oh. Not for the children's story. For the next song.
Testing. All right. Weren't you blessed? You know, uh, <clears throat> we want to thank you for coming. I know that you could have chosen other churches, but you came here. You know, this reminds me, um, I was a school teacher. Prior to becoming a pastor, I taught your grades. I taught high school, junior high. I was a principal, and uh, those, that's many years back, but this brought so many memories, good memories. I truly enjoyed um, teaching and being part of the school system, but uh, God had another plan. I got a call to ministry, and uh, sometime I'll let the church know what, how that came about, but it's a blessing to have you, and want to thank you once again. Thank the teacher that's here with us, and uh, thank you so much. We praise God. <clears throat> so this morning, the title, as you can see, the title of my message, I'm going to put my T here. I have problems with allergies, so once in a while I'll be sipping here. Somebody asked, what do you have in there? It's just tea. <laughs> Dandelion tea. They say it's good for our allergies, so. <clears throat> but anyway... The title of our message this morning is going to be Living with Giants. You know, um, I don't know if you ever, when, I'm, when I talk about giants, I'm referring to uh, someone over seven feet. I had the opportunity, when I was uh, 12 years of age, the Harlem Globetrotters came into town. These were, this was a basketball team, uh, African-American uh, basketball team. And um, they took us to this game to watch the Harlem Globetrotters. After the game was over, we had the opportunity to um, see the players. And I had never seen someone that tall. I was 12 years old. And I remember they had a player by the name of Will Chamberlain. I mean, yeah, Will Chamberlain. He was 7'1". He had just graduated from the university of Kansas. And I remember standing in front of him, looking up, along with other kids. Is there an echo on this? Okay. And I remember looking up, and um, in our neighborhood, there was no one that size. And so I remember he even felt a little uncomfortable with us kids looking up. Uh, we were looking at him like a weird bird, you know. I mean, never seen somebody that tall. So um, 
but he doesn't compare it to some of the other modern giants. For example, Robert Wadlow, he grew to be this man here in the middle. Those are average guys. He grew to be 8'11", almost 9 feet. <clears throat> and um, he's the tallest man recorded in the uh, Guinness Book of, Book, uh, Book of Records. He was known as the giant from Illinois. And he weighed 485 pounds. He had a shoe size of 37. <clears throat> he had a monster shoe. <clears throat> he was very well known in his day. He traveled with the uh, Wrigley Circus, and he went all over the country. He was well known. And, um, but he died at the age of 22. He got a foot infection. Back then, they didn't have penicillin. So he had this foot infection, and um, for his funeral, for his funeral, 40,000 people attended. His casket, they say, was 10 feet. His coffin was 10 feet. And it took 12 strong men to carry it. Now, the tallest woman that's existed, how tall do you think she was? She was 8 feet 2 inches. This, that's her here. That's a normal woman there next to her. Zing Jinlin. And uh, she over, she was a towering lady. But you know what? These modern giants, they do not compare to the giants that David, that David um, confronted in his days. How tall were his giants? The giants that David confronted. According to, I looked at some of the commentaries, and there's different heights. Adam and Clark says nine feet, nine inches. Gray and, and Adam say 10 feet. SDA commentary says 10.5. You know, all we know, all we know is that these warriors that David confronted, they were powerful. They were powerful men because they were warriors and they were, they were armed from head to toe. And so the Bible tells us and this is one of the points I want to make. The Bible tells us that David confronted giants throughout his life. Not once, but throughout his life, he confronted giants. He confronted giants when he was a teenager. Yes, the first giant that David killed is the one that most people remember, and that was Goliath. Yes. And we remember Goliath because his defeat of Goliath was so spectacular <clears throat> that it transformed the life of a shepherd boy that used to work out in the fields to a national hero. And so, as a teenager, he confronted Goliath, <clears throat> thanks to the good Lord. And as an adult, you know, after defeating Goliath, King Saul Named, <clears throat> named David to be the captain of the army. And so he met a lot of giants, mostly with the Philistines. And um, there's one giant that was physically different than the rest of the giants. And he was a menace. I mean, this, this giant was big and different. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 20, Yet again, there was a war in Gath where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also was born to the giant. The giant, there was a line of giants. And so, all through his life, David confronted giants. Lastly, as an elderly man, he thought he was already tired, he was old. Many years later, Israel once again was fighting with the Philistines, was at war with the Philistines. And um, he was no longer 
a young man. He had been an adult. He had been a king. And now he was an old, tired warrior. And the Bible tells us that when they went out to war against the Philistines, that there was a giant by the name of Ishbanab. He almost killed David. 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 to 17 says this. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbanab, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shackles, and who was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Sariah, came to David's rescue. That was his nephew. Came to his rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle, so that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. <clears throat> you know, people that read the story of, of David, they generally think of the first giant, which was Goliath. Few recognize that David, throughout his life, as a young man to his old age, he confronted giants, <clears throat> menacing giants, warriors, throughout his life. Not just Goliath. And um, in our lives, your life and my life, giants are part of our life. We meet giants. Now, have you ever thought that giants are real? Giants are not a figment of our imagination. They're not something we dream up. What would qualify for a giant in our age <clears throat> today? David faced giants throughout his life. And you and me, you and I, are going to face giants. Now, we're not going to face a literal giant. I'm not talking about literal giants. How then does this story fit our lives? What are some of the giants that we're going to face? Let's not look around us. Oh, our greatest giants are internal. Did you catch that? Our greatest giants are internal. <clears throat> they are within us. And they appear when we least expect them. There is a giant of resentment. When a person has resentment. There's, and you could probably add to this list. There's a giant of fear, when fear comes upon us for whatever situation. There is a giant of loneliness. There is a giant of guilt and shame for something a person has done in the past. Or there is a giant of worry. Some people worry. But like they say, worry is like a rocking chair. It gets you nowhere. There's also the giant of discouragement. When you get down, something happens that gets you down. <clears throat> There's also the giant of fear, of failure. And this is a big one. Failure in your work, failure in your home, raising your chil children. That's a giant. There's a giant of jealousy and envy. There's a giant of depression, despair, the giant of bitterness, of pride. These giants come up and... We're going to see how we deal with these giants. The giant of hopelessness. I don't know if you've been there. There's a giant of bitterness. There's a giant of self selfishness and greed. Everything this way, like the rake. It's all about me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there's a giant of doubt and unbelief. And we see David's men, we see David, his soldiers facing this giant. And there's a giant of anger, losing your cool, becoming angry. 
And there is a giant of self-condemnation. And there's a giant of a critical spirit. These are giants that we have to face throughout our lives. You know, usually these giants defeat us much faster than outer giants, outer things, things on the outside. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. What is Satan using as a giant to stop you from becoming the person, the Christian that God wants you to be? Do you have resentment in your heart towards someone who did something wrong, uh, something that has happened in your past? Or are you running away from something that God has called you to do for him? Or <clears throat> are you facing marital or financial difficulties in your home? Or are you having trouble with guilt or shame that you feel because of something that happened in the past? These are giants. <clears throat> Has something taken place in your past that so disappointed you, so disappointed you, that you can't get over it, you can't put it behind you? <clears throat> it, is, it may be an impossible situation that you're going through at work, at school, at home. It may be a dream that seems unreachable. These are giants. Doubt is a big one. Keeping on the fight of faith. <clears throat> Life is a journey. And keeping up the fight of faith. Keeping our shield up. Before we can defeat our giants, what we find in the life of David, we find this, that there's obstacles. David wanted to fight the giant. He believed in God. He had faith in God. He wanted to face the giant, but there were doubters. The army, the Israelite army, didn't believe, didn't think that David could defeat Goliath. They saw this shepherd, a shepherd boy, and um, then they see this giant that would come out for 40 days, he would come out twice a day and challenge them. So when they looked at David, and they looked at the uh, giant that is armed from head to toe, and they see uh, David with a slingshot, they said, oh, no. So there was a lot of doubters. And what else did David, uh, David encountered before he went out to meet the giant? He encountered criticism. He encountered criticism from those close to him. From his brother Eliab. His brother really went into him, really got into it. He said this, <clears throat> Why have you come down here, talking to David? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. <clears throat> That's hard. Your own family doesn't believe in you, then you can go out and fight that giant. I mean, and the other um, obstacle was the army, the Israelite army. They were cowards. You know, none of them wanted to go out, including Saul. They didn't want to go out and meet that giant. And then there was the obstacle of concern. And this was real. David had to overcome the obstacle of concern before he went out to meet the giant. King Saul didn't think that David had a chance. In his eyes, David was a kid. No chance in the world to defeat Goliath. He tells David, you're only a boy. And Goliath has been a fighting man from his youth. And so he had to meet these obstacles before he could go out 
He knew, David knew in his heart that he could defeat the giant. But these concerns, these obstacles came into his life. <clears throat> the question I have as I was reading this story, why does God allow giants in our life, in our path? I read the list of giants, and there's others. There's a giant of immorality, and some wrestle with, fight with that giant. But why God, does God allow them? You know, a soldier becomes a real man in battle. And we never grow up. We need the giants. We need the giants, struggles, trials to make us stronger. Yes. And you know the giants won't leave us alone till we got, go out. In other words, when we stand up to them. We see this in David's life. <clears throat> I mean, for 40 days, the giant would go out and challenge the army of Israel. And he didn't stop. He would go out two, days, time, two, uh, uh, two times a day. He didn't stop until David went down to the valley and fought that giant. That happens in our life. We need to meet up with those giants. We need to face them, but in the name of God, not on our own strength. Because giants are going to be part of our life. They were part of David's life throughout his life. And they're going to be part of our life throughout our life. And they'll make us stronger. But you know what? <clears throat> Whenever we stand up to one of these giants, if it's resentment, if it's bitterness, whatever it is, in the name of God, Miraculous things happen, like happened with David. Yes, David needed Goliath. Think of it this way. David needed Goliath. He didn't realize it, of course, at the time, that he needed Goliath. <clears throat> to fight Goliath, fighting Goliath was simply another, the next thing that God had put for him to do. But he needed Goliath. You know Why? in order to gain the confidence of the people that he truly was qualified to be their leader, to be their king. The people had to know that the man they followed was worthy of their trust. And David proved that when he defeated Goliath. They said, this is our man. Now, <clears throat> so it might sound strange, when we say we need giants in our life. But giants bring us closer to the Lord. When things are real peaceful, a lot of times we need these giants. And we need to ask the Lord. We go to the Lord. <clears throat> so they're there for our spiritual help. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. What gave David the courage and the confidence to fight Goliath? And this is where we get, this is how we learn how we can fight our giants. It's very important. This, we're entering this part now that is so important. He had to convince King Saul that he could go out and defeat Goliath. So what does he do? He does recall. He does recall. He remembers his past victories, the past victories that he had. David began to remember how God had taken care of him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 36 and 37, it says, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has what? He has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. <clears throat> See, David kept, we could call it a spiritual file in his mind and his heart, of the things that the Lord had done for him. You know, I can see David listening to Saul, coming up with all reasons why he couldn't go out to face Goliath. David goes over to his filing cabin in his heart and mind, he looks under the B file. He remembers how God was with him. 
And God helped him to kill a bear. Then he goes to the elf file, and he remembers how God helped him defeat a lion. So he does recall. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we need to do the same. When these lions appear before us, <clears throat> the lions I've already talked about, when they come up, we need to do recall and remember past victories. I believe that it would do some good to back to our spiritual filing cabinet, which is in our heart, and pull up some files. Pull up some files of what God has done for you, what he's done for me. Look under the H file. Think of what the hurt that you felt through an experience that you went through or you might be going through. Look under the H file, the hurt. Then think about the healing that God brought to your family. Physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. <clears throat> Look under the F file. Think of the failures in your life. The many times you missed the mark. The many times you, you sinned. You fell short. <clears throat> then think about the forgiveness that God gave you time and time again. God is a good God. Or look under the D file. Think of the deep depression that you were in. You know, you were really down in the pits. You don't know how you got there, <clears throat> but you know one thing, that it was God that got you out of that pit, out of that depression. We should never forget as Christians, what God has done for us in the past. As we look back over the circumstances and situations we've been through, <clears throat> we will discover that God was just preparing us to face giants that were still ahead. <clears throat> Remember this, if God gave you strength and victory in the past, he will give you strength and victory in the present. There might be someone here this morning that's facing one of these giants. And think back <clears throat> when God delivered you. And recall the facts of your victories. David's confidence, <clears throat> David's confidence rested in the God who had brought him through all these giants that he met in his life. David knew that his God was bigger, stronger, mightier than Goliath. <clears throat> There's a famous quote that we find in Life Sketches. It's of Ellen White, and page 196. What does it say? We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our present, in our <clears throat> teachings in our past history. So we need to do recall. Whenever you meet a giant, I don't know what you're going through today, but I'll tell you one thing. We all meet giants. These giants appear, and they challenge us. So we need to recall past victories. <clears throat> we need to have a unmovable faith in God like David. You know, as I was reading this story, the faith of David, you know, I heard a definition. I heard a definition of faith that has stayed with me. <clears throat> it goes like this. Faith is belief plus unbelief. Faith is what? Belief and unbelief and acting on the belief part. You know, did David, David know something that, his, um, that Saul and the soldiers didn't know? Did David know something <clears throat> that they didn't know? No, he didn't. They also knew, the army, Saul, they also knew that God was great, he was mighty and powerful, that he was the 
Lord of hosts. They knew that. <clears throat> so it isn't just head knowledge. It has to know, it's more than that. Any one of those soldiers could have gone out and killed Goliath. Any one of them. If they were willing to take that first step and believe that the Lord could give them the victory. The difference between David and those other soldiers was not that he had faith and they had doubts or that they had doubts and he had none. <clears throat> Here's the difference. Follow me here. The difference is this. David acted on his belief and ignored his doubts. Did you get that? David acted on what? On his belief and ignored his doubts. While they, talking about the army, talking about King Saul, they acted on their doubts and ignored their belief. They ignored their faith. You know what? Faith is not waiting for 100% assurance that you're going you're to do it. No, if you, if you do that, you're going to wait forever. Faith is seeing the giant, whatever it is in your life, understanding the odds, believing that God wants to defeat that giant, and then taking the first step of faith. Isaiah 41.10. You know, when we meet our giants, sometimes we're afraid. This is a beautiful promise to remember. <clears throat> Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. In other words, don't be discouraged. For I am, with, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you or help you. Some versions say, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God will come through for you. He'll come through for me because we're going to be, once again, David faced giants throughout his life. This is part of what they call sanctification. It's a work of a lifetime. We're going to meet giants. But we need to have recall. Remember God's victories in our life. We need to have this kind of faith. Yes. And if you do that, God's going to, says, you know, you take that first step of faith. Not because you think that you can do it, but because you know you can't. Therefore, you know that if the giant is defeated, if he goes down, whatever the giant is in your life, it is because God has done it through you. Yes, he gets the glory. <clears throat> you know the reason that these stories are in the Bible? The reason these stories are there for, is to give us, to help us, you know, they're to give us faith. Faith in, in, in to face our giants that we're going to have in life. Yes. So, you know, another thing that David did. David faced Goliath in the name of the Lord. Not on his own. 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the Lord, name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I don't have to remind you. There's power in the name of God. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. There's power in his name. Yes, <clears throat> when you face your giant, when you face it, take time to call upon God. Don't go at it alone. There might be someone here this morning that's meeting one of these giants in your life. Call on the name of the Lord. He will help you. <clears throat> you know, there's power in the name of Jesus. Yes, when you face your giant, you know, call on his name. It makes no difference, no difference what you are facing what your giant is. And they're different for each one of us. I don't know what you're going through, but I know one thing, that there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of the Lord. Yes. You can defeat any giant that comes your way. You know why? Stronger is he that is in us 
then he who is in the world. If, he's, if we have that connection, you know, alone, we cannot defeat our inner giants. <clears throat> There's no way. Jesus is our only hope of defeating whatever giant you're facing today. Yes, there's power, the all-powerful name of the Lord. You know what? Because Jesus has defeated our biggest enemy. Who was our biggest enemy? Satan. He defeated him on the cross for you and for me. We're saved through grace, through what Jesus has done. His substitutionary death in your place, in my place. We were supposed to die. He took our place. His life is important. Jesus' life. You know, <clears throat> he lived a perfect life. And he will, if you accept Jesus Christ, he will credit you with that perfect life. His victories become our victories. You will be declared righteous even though you're a work in progress. Beautiful. And then comes the second part. Imparted righteousness. He comes to live in us to defeat giants in our life. To help us be victorious. So we need him. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, he defeated the enemy. <clears throat> David recognized something very important. He recognized, <clears throat> excuse me, that the battle was not his. But God's. In 1 Samuel 17 47, all those gathered here, he's talking about the armies, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is who? The battle is the Lord's. Yes, the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. <clears throat> if you're facing a giant this morning, one of these giants, you know, it's not your battle. It's the Lord's. He will help you through. So once again, <clears throat> remember, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be doubters, and David's going to try to put doubt in you and people around you. But remember, remember that God, remember recall. Remember God, how God has worked in your life in the past. Yes, and remember that <clears throat> you're going to have doubts, but remember that we have to act on the believe part, on the faith part, and God will come through. And remember, lastly, <clears throat> that there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in his name. So we need to call upon him. We need to come. Jesus gave his life for us. And he wants to help us. He wants to help us make it through. And this morning, there might be someone here this morning that is facing a giant. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And God wants to give you the victory. And he wants to defeat that giant through you. But you have to believe, and he will do it. God will help you. So remember these points. There's going to be giants throughout your life. They were throughout David's life. But the thing, they make us stronger if we rely on God. So do recall, believe, and trust in the name of the Lord Almighty. God bless you.
Good morning, church. Please stand with us as we sing our closing song, Shout to the Lord. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Music is, like I mentioned earlier, such a part of worship. We're here to worship God, right? I want to thank the uh, Conejo Valley Adventist School, thank the teacher that's here with us. I think it's such a blessing. You have been a blessing for us today. And so at this time, let us bow our heads for a benediction. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you're with us. We thank you, God, that we could depend on you when we're going through difficult times, through trials. 
We pray that you would be with anyone here that is facing a giant. And God, we thank you for defeating that giant through them. And God, we ask that you will be with us as we travel. Give us traveling mercies, for we pray these things. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. amen. Have a happy Sabbath. God bless you. <clears throat>